Welcome back, friends, to part two. In part one, we found that God in his word gave us 12 identifying marks, we could call them, to help us know who this Antichrist power is. In part one, we looked at those 12 identifying points, those 12 identifying marks, and we finished with the question, well, who is this particular power? Who is the power that fits these identifying marks? Now, we are going to discover right now that there is only one power on the face of the earth that fits these 12 identifying marks. There is no mistake who this particular power is. Now, as we went through those 12 identifying marks, by this point, without me telling you who it is, you should be able to tell me who this particular power is. Let's just quickly review those 12 identifying marks. Mark number one, it arose out of the Roman Empire. Two, in Europe. Three, after 476 AD. Four, it uproots three kingdoms as it comes to power. Five, it's a religious and a political power, a religio-political power. Six, has a powerful man as its leader. Seven, it's more powerful than the other horns that were before it. Eight, it speaks blasphemy against God. Nine, it would attempt to change the law of God. Ten, it would persecute God's people. Eleven, it reigned for 1260 years. And twelve, it eventually receives a deadly wound. And the Bible tells us that the deadly wound would be healed and all the world wandered and followed and worshipped this beast. Who is, this is the question friends, who is the power of Revelation chapter 13 and Daniel chapter 7? Who is this power? Now before I tell you who this particular power is, I want to explain one point to you here. This particular power is a system of which many, many people belong. I am not talking about the people, I'm talking about the system. We're not talking about people, we're talking about a system that God is identifying. Who is the power of Revelation 13 and Daniel chapter 7? Well, friends, there is no other power if you're going to be honest with those 12 identifying marks on the face of this earth that fits those marks other than the papacy and the Roman Catholic system. Now, that may shock many of you because the Roman Catholic system is a Christian church. How can that be the great antichrist power of Bible prophecy? Now, once again, I want to remind you, I'm not talking about the people. There's many godly, lovely people in the Roman Catholic Church. I'm talking about the system. I myself come from a Roman Catholic background. My family are all Roman Catholic. In fact, I actually have a sister-in-law who is a nun in the Roman Catholic system. And many of these people do a fantastic work in helping people around the world. I'm not identifying the people. Don't go out of here and say, hey, if you're a Catholic, you're an Antichrist. I'm not saying that. But we're talking about the system. God is identifying the system here. And he's warning us about the falsehoods of this system. Let's now go through quickly these 12 identifying marks. And let's prove how they fit the Roman Catholic system and the Roman system only. The first identifying mark that we looked at, that the Bible gave us, was that this power arose from the Roman Empire. Did the Roman Catholic Church arise from the Roman Empire? Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, friends. History is as clear as a bell that the Roman Church simply arose out of the Roman Empire. There's a couple of statements here from history. It says, to the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. As the Roman Empire was going down, Constantine moved the capital from Rome to Constantinople. And when he left, there was more and more and more power given to the pontiffs or the popes or the bishops of Rome. And as the Roman Empire died, the power was slowly transferred to the Christian so-called Roman Empire. Notice another statement here. It says the popes filled the place of the vacant emperors of Rome, inheriting their power, prestige and titles from paganism. The papacy is but the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon its grave. And friends, that's exactly what it is. It was a continuation in a Christian so-called form of the old Roman Empire. 
One more. The mighty Catholic Church was little more than Rome, the Roman Empire, baptized. Rome was transformed as well as converted. The very capital of the old empire became the capital of the Christian Empire. The office of Pontifus Maximus was continued in that of the Pope. Even the Roman language has remained the official language of the Roman Catholic Church down through the ages. And that's exactly true, friends. Where is the heart of the Roman Catholic system? It's in Rome. They are called Roman Catholic. Why? Because they just came out of the Roman Empire. They were a continuation of the Roman Empire. What is the official language of the Roman system? It's Latin, the Roman language. Where did it receive its power? It received its powers from the emperors of Rome. Identifying mark number one fits to a T to the Roman system. Our second identifying mark was arose among the ten horns. Remember in that vision of Daniel, he saw the little horn arise amongst the ten horns and we discovered it must be somewhere there in Europe. Did the Roman Catholic system arise in Europe? Well, we know very clearly from history that the Roman system arose right there in Rome itself, right in the heart of the old Roman Empire, right there amongst those ten original divisions of the Roman Empire. The Vatican State is right there in Italy, in Rome today, and that is where it came from way back in the days of the Roman Empire when it was falling, to, falling, to, falling apart. Identifying mark number three, it would arise after the ten horns. Now we remember that those ten original horns, those ten Germanic tribes that came more down from the north, they settled in the area of the Roman Empire by the year 476 AD. So the little horn would arise after the year 476 AD. It would come to power after the year 476 AD. And we find through history that the Roman Catholic system came to power in the year 5. 38. Why do I say that? That brings us to our next identifying mark, four. It uproots three kingdoms. As the Roman system came to power, it uprooted three of those original horns. Those three original kingdoms that were uprooted were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. How did the, the, uh, the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths become uprooted when the papacy came to power? You see, in the year 533, Emperor Justinian, the Roman emperor, decreed that the bishop of Rome or the pope of Rome to be the universal bishop of the world, the corrector of heretics, and the, all, the, the empire was to become Roman Catholic. Now, many of the people didn't want to become part of the Roman system. And some of the different nations didn't want the authority of the Roman system above them. Three of those particular powers were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. They were Aryan nations. They were opposed to the Catholic system. And because they were opposed, they had to be removed out of the way for the papacy to come to supremacy. And they said, we are not going to worship the Pope as the supreme ruler of Christianity. So what happened was Justinian's forces basically destroyed them. His decree went forward in the year 533 we find that those three horns were plucked up. The Heruli in the year 493, sorry. We find the Vandals in the year 534 and the Ostrogoths in the year 538. Now what took place as Justinian's decree went forward in 533, there were still the Vandals and the Ostrogoths left. In the year 534, the next year, the Vandals were taken out and a few years later, five years later, in 538, the last of those opposing powers, the Ostrogoths, was uprooted, it was destroyed, it was taken out of the way. And from that point forward, the year 538, Justinian's decree that all must join the Catholic Church or leave the empire or have their goods confiscated was put into effect. And as a result, thousands tried to leave the empire. There was a great massacre as thousands tried to escape. But it was the year 538 that the Roman system came to power and those three horns were finally all plucked up by the roots. Now you can go into history, get your encyclopedia out and look up the Vandals, the Ostrogoths or the Heruli and you will find that shortly after they were destroyed, they disappeared off the scene of history. 
The Bible said they would be plucked up by the roots, and that's exactly what took place. They were totally destroyed, totally annihilated, as if they were plucked up by the roots, and they don't exist amongst us today. And this fits exactly as the Bible tells us it should with the Roman Catholic system. That when it comes to power, three of the horns had to be plucked up and these three powers were destroyed to make way for the papacy to gain control. The Heruli, the Vandals and the Ostrogoths were those three powers. Identifying mark number five, that this power was different from the other horns. This little horn power was to be different from the others. The papacy was to be different. And we find today, friends, exactly what the Bible says is exactly what the papacy is. Remember Revelation 13, verse 4, and they worshipped the beast. The papacy is not just a state power, it is a religious power as well. It's a religio-political power. The Roman Catholic Church is not just a church, it is also a state. In fact, it has its own constitution, has its own coinage, seal, flag, newspaper, radio, ambassadors. It's not just a political, a religious power, friends. It's a political power in the world. And we are going to discover in our future lectures that this particular power, which basically lives on 108 acres there in Rome, in Italy, is the most powerful nation on the face of this earth. Why is it, if they are just religious, that you have nations of the world that send political ambassadors to the Vatican and vice versa. You know, back in the early 1980s, when Ronald Reagan was president of America, for the first time ever, because America and the papacy have always been poles apart. One was Protestant, one was, of course, Catholic. They've been diametrically opposed. And when Ronald Reagan decided to send an ambassador over to the Vatican, the American people were upset. But he said this. He said, I am not sending him over there as a religious ambassador, I am sending him over there as a political ambassador. And the people thought, well, that's okay. And around the world today, friends, there are more than 100 nations that have state representatives at the Vatican. It's a religio-political power. Our sixth identifying mark, we found that this power has a powerful man as its leader. Does the Roman Catholic Church have a powerful man as its leader? Well, they tell us this. They say, but the supreme teacher in the church is the Roman pontiff. Union of minds, therefore, requires complete submission and obedience to the will of the church and the Roman pontiff, or the pope, as to God himself. There's a very powerful leader at the head of the Roman Catholic Church, and that leader is the Pope of Rome. Identifying Mark number 7, we discovered that the look of this power was more stout than the other horns. It was a more powerful uh, power. It would rule in a greater way than the other ten horns that were before it. You know, the papacy ruled, especially back in the Dark Ages, as no other power has ruled. In the book Papacy and World Affairs, it says this, Under the Roman Empire, the popes had no temporal power. But when the Roman Empire had disintegrated and its place had been taken by a number of rude, barbarous kingdoms, the Roman Catholic Church not only became independent of the states in religious affairs, but dominated secular affairs as well. It was the dominating power, friends. It grew into such a strong power that eventually, when kings came in to, to see the Pope, they would have to bow down and kiss his foot. It was Pope Eugenius II, who died in 827 AD, that made the law that when you would come in before the Pope, you would kneel down and you would kiss his foot. And from that time, it was necessary to kneel before the Popes to have an audience with them. It was Pope Gregory VII, I believe it was, that ordered all princes to submit to this practice. And our friends, when you look at this, this is power, isn't it? If I was to be able to command you today to bow before me and kiss my foot, that would show I am a powerful person, wouldn't that be right? But the strange part is, friends, that the Bible tells us that Jesus himself said that anyone among you that thinks himself to be the chief, let him be your servant. There seems to be a great contrast between the way the papacy ruled through the Dark Ages 
and our Lord and Saviour, the way He ruled and walked this earth, in meekness and in humility. God did not command man to be honoured by other men. Jesus said, Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Don't be the boss, be the servant. But they ruled with power as no other nation in Europe was able to rule with. Identifying Mark number 8. We are told this power speaks great words and blasphemy against God. Now remember, we looked at, in part 1, two identifying points from the Bible of what blasphemy is. The first one was claiming to be equal with God and the second one was claiming for man, claiming the power to forgive sins. Does the Roman system claim to be equal with God and do they claim the power to be able to forgive sins? Well, of course they do, friends. Notice these statements on the screen here. This is the encyclical letters of Leo the Thirteenth. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. The papacy believes and the Pope himself believes that he is in the place of God Almighty on this earth. Friends, that is blasphemy according to the Scriptures. That is actually blasphemy in my mind to the highest degree. Another statement here says this, The Pope is of so great a dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were God and the vicar of God. The Pope is as it were the vicar of God on earth, chief king of kings, having plenitude of power. Friends, there's only one person in this universe that's referred to as the King of Kings, and that's Jesus Christ. But they believe the Pope is also the representative of God on earth, King of Kings, having plenitude of power. Notice this statement. It says, All names which in the Scripture are applied to, the, to Christ, by virtue of which it is established that He is over the church, all the same names are applied to the Pope. And when you first look at that, you think, well, that's not that big of a deal. But when you start to understand the names that the Bible applies to Jesus Christ, and they're saying that's the same names that the Pope has, some of those names are this, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father, Wonderful, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. They claim to be equal with God. And according to the Bible, friends, that is blasphemy. What about the power to forgive sins? You know, the only one who can forgive our sins is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to this world. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin, for my sin. Man has not the ability to read the human heart and to forgive the sinner. You know, there was a story I read about a lady who was dying in hospital. And as she was dying there, a Roman Catholic priest came by and said to her, Would you like to confess your sins to me before you die? She was a bit delirious. She was close to death, but she said to this Catholic priest, please show me your hands. He gave her his hands and she looked at him and said, you are an imposter. The only one who can forgive my sins has holes in his hands. And you know, friends, Jesus Christ is the only one that can forgive your sins. But the Catholic Church believes that they have the power invested into the priest to be able to forgive the sins of mankind. Notice a few of these statements. Seek where you will, through heaven and earth, and you will find one created being who can forgive the sinner, who can free him from the chains of hell. That extraordinary being is the priest, the Roman Catholic priest. Friends, according to the Bible, that is telling us that is blasphemy. That is blasphemy in the highest degree. Jesus Christ is the only one that can forgive us of our sins. There's another statement here. Were the Redeemer to descend into a church and to sit in a confessional to administer the sacrament of penance and a priest to sit in a confessional, the penitence of each would equally be equally absolved. One more. The poor sinner kneels at his confessor's feet. He knows that he is not speaking to an ordinary man, but to another Christ. He hears the words, I absolve thy sins, and the hidden load of sin drops from his soul forever. Friends, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the one that can forgive our sins. And all of this man-made religion, all it does is shuts Jesus Christ out from our view. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus, my friends, is the one we are to look to, not looking to man. 
identifying mark number nine, we were told that this power would change, or attempt to at least, change the law of God. Has the Roman Catholic system changed the law of God? Well, first of all, they believe that they have the power to do so. Notice this statement here. It says, The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. So they believe for a start that they can change the law of God because they believe they are God on earth, which is a fair enough statement, I suppose. But can man change God's law? And have they tried to change the law? And this is something that shocks most people when they look at this. They've never realized this. But if you go into the Catholic Church, you come to soon realize that they've actually changed the law of God. You'll notice on the screen here, there's a, two, there's a chart, two charts comparing the two laws. The law of God as given in the Bible and the law of God as shown in the Roman Catholic Catechism. You'll find in the Roman Catholic Catechism law that one of the commandments is missing. It's actually the second commandment. The second commandment is gone. It's not there. Now, what is the second commandment dealing with? For those who know their Bibles, we know the second commandment deals with making graven images and bowing ourselves down to them. Why do you think that the Roman Catholic Church has taken out of their Ten Commandments the commandment that says, don't make any graven images and don't bow down thyself to them? The answer is simple, friends, because all through their church, all through their worship system is images. A statues of saints and statues of God and Mary and Jesus. And they bow down themselves to worship them at times. Now, when they did this, they had a bit of trouble here because if you take one of the commandments out, you don't have Ten Commandments anymore. Now, how can you make the movie The Ten Commandments when you've only got nine commandments left? You've got to have Ten Commandments. So what they did to rectify the problem is they split the last commandment in two. The last commandment talks about not coveting thy neighbor's wife and coveting thy neighbor's goods and so forth. They made the ninth commandment, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, and the tenth commandment, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, his manservant, his maidservant, and so forth. But friends, just as Bible prophecy predicted to us, this system came along and it has changed the law of God and it's changed God's law in other places, and I'll deal with that in our next couple of lectures. There is only one power on the face of the earth that's changed God's law, friends, and that is the Roman system, not the people. We're talking about the system here. A little while ago, I got talking to a gentleman. He was a very staunch Roman Catholic, and I respect any person's religion, especially when they follow that religion. The sad part is today too many Christians say things, but they don't do them. Well, this was a Catholic man that followed his religion to the T. And he found out that I was once a Roman Catholic Christian. He said, how come you left the church? How could you leave the true church of God? And I said, well, look, there's a few reasons why. I said, one of the reasons I could give you straight off the, off the top of my head is that I found out that the Catholic system changed God's Ten Commandments. And he was taken back for a moment. He said, what do you mean the Catholic system has changed God's Ten Commandments? We've never changed God's commandments. I said, if you look at the Roman Catholic Catechism, because the Catholic Catechism is the official teachings of the Roman Church. They change over the centuries, but they're still the official teachings of the Roman Church. I said, if you look at a Roman Catholic Catechism, you will find that the Ten Commandments have been changed and that the Second Commandment has been removed and the Last Commandment has been split into two to keep the Ten. He said, you wait right here. I have just bought in the last week the latest Roman Catholic Catechism and I want you to show me from that book where the commandments have been changed. And when I heard that, I thought, wow, wow, I hope, I hope I can find in this new catechism where it's been changed in the law. He comes out to the front door of this house. I was speaking to him there. He invites me in. He sits me down. He gives me the catechism you see on the screen. He says, you find where the law has been changed. And I found the section where it talks about the Ten Commandments. It has a little chapter on each of the commandments explaining what the commandments mean and so forth. And I discovered as I was going through the book that the second commandment was missing. And I said, here, here it is. So you've got commandment number one, there's no number two, and we go to three and we go right down, and the last one's been split into two. He was just dumbfounded. He was just so shocked he didn't know what to say. All he could say was, I'm going to go and see the priest tomorrow morning and try and sort this out. But friends, they have changed the law of 
God. And they believe they have the power to do so. Identifying mark number 10, this particular power was going to persecute and kill the saints of God. Has the Roman system persecuted the true church of God through the ages? Anybody that has a little bit of knowledge of history knows full well that the Roman system persecuted millions upon millions of Christians because they simply wouldn't follow the Roman system. A good example is St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. You know, Protestants still shudder today as they recall the events of St. Bartholomew's Day in August 22, 1572. It was on that day that Pope Gregory the Thirteenth executed a plot in which he killed between 50 and 70,000 Huguenots, mostly on the first day, the rest in about a two-month period. The Inquisition, the Crusades against the Huguenots, the Waldenses, the Albigenses, the Thirty Year War, the Rack, the Dungeon, the Flames, the Martyrs burned at the stake are all historically linked to the Roman system throughout the Dark Ages. You know, it's estimated that around 150 million people were put to death during the Dark Ages by the Roman system. 150 million people, friends. Why were they put to death? They were put to death simply because they refused to worship according to the dictates of the Catholic system. There's some statements from history here. The church has persecuted only a tyro, which means amateur in church history, will deny that. We have always defended the persecution of the Huguenots and the Spanish Inquisition. When she thinks it good to use physical force, she will use it. Another one here. That the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. Another one here. Great numbers were driven from their habitations with their wives and children, stripped and naked, many of them inhumanely massacred. One more. It has been calculated that the popes of Rome have directly or indirectly slain 50 millions of men and women who refused to be parties to Romish idolatries who held to the Bible as the word of God. Why were so many martyred, friends? The simple answer to that question is many wanted to worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. They wanted to read the Bible. Many were martyred simply because they read the word of God. Many were martyred simply because they owned a portion of the scripture. And thousands were burnt at the stake because they refused to follow a system that they identified as the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. You know, what I'm sharing with you tonight isn't something that I just found a little while ago. All of the reformers and all of the Protestant churches up until probably the last hundred years all identified Rome as the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. It's nothing new that I'm sharing with you tonight. It's just old knowledge that many have believed in in the past. Identifying Mark number 11, this power would reign for 1260 years. 1260 years. How does this fit into the life of the papacy? Notice this chart on our screen. The 1260 years of papal supremacy. We learned there at the start of this lecture that the papacy came to power in the year 538 when the Ostrogoths, the last of those three horned powers, was overthrown. If we add 1260 years to the year 538, it brings us down to the year 1798. What happened in the year 1798? This is the 1260 years of which the papacy reigned. It's basically known as the Dark Ages. But when we come down to the year 1798, we find something very interesting take place. We find that the papacy receives a blow. Now, the Bible told us that this power would receive a deadly wound. And in the year 1798, we find Napoleon, he sends his general Berthier down to Rome to take the Pope captive because Napoleon was trying to do what? He was trying to conquer the world, wasn't he? Of course, the papacy was in his way. He sends his general down there. They take the Pope captive. The, the, uh, the papacy at that stage loses its power. The Pope dies in captivity. And from that point, the papacy received a deadly wound. 
Many believe when this took place that the papacy was dead. It was going to be extinct forever. But the Bible told us something different. The Bible tells us in our 12th identifying mark that it receives a deadly wound, but the wound would be healed. When Berthea took the Pope captive, notice what the world thought. It says the papacy was extinct. Not a vestige of its existence remained, and among all the Roman Catholic powers, not a finger was stirred in its defence. One more there. The enemies of the church rejoiced. The last pope, they declared, had resigned. In the eyes of the world, friends, the papacy was finished forever. It was extinct. It received a deadly blow. It received a deadly wound. In other words, it was dead. But friends, the Bible tells us something different. The Bible tells us, yes, it would receive a deadly wound, but that that wound would be healed. Revelation 13, verse 3. The wound would be healed. And ever since the year 1798, when the papacy received that deadly wound, the papacy has slowly been growing back to power. Step by step, it's been growing back to power. And in the year 1929, we find a big step take place. In the year 1929, we find the dictator Mussolini give back much of the power to the papacy that the papacy lost. There was a historic concordance signed between Mussolini and the papacy, and the papacy received a big healing to the wound it received in 1798. Now, when this took place in 1929, the San Francisco Chronicle reported on this, and notice the words that they used in the article. The Roman question tonight was a thing of the past, and the Vatican was at peace with Italy. In affixing the autographs to the memorable document, healing the wound, extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. Without realizing it, the San Francisco Chronicle used the exact words of the Bible about healing the wound. And friends, ever since 1929, the papacy has been growing back its power faster and faster and faster. Until today, as we'll discover in our next lectures, there is so much power in the papacy that when the recent Pope died just a couple of years ago, the world bowed down to honour this Pope. We'll go into that in our future lectures. But the question simply is this, friends. Who will you worship? God has revealed to you and I tonight who this particular power is. It's a heavy subject. It's an offensive subject because there's many faithful, godly, lovely Christians in the Roman Catholic Church. I was one of those people once. And when I heard this for the first time, it struck me. But I got my Bible, I began to study and I began to read. And I came to the conclusion that the Word of God is so clear that it cannot fit any other power on the earth. And the question is for you and I, who will you and I worship? Will it be the God of heaven and the laws of heaven? Or will it be the laws of and the systems of men. Now we can look at this tonight and feel a bit overwhelmed. And we're wondering how will we survive this whole thing. But I want to share the good news that comes at the end of the vision of Daniel chapter 7. It's a very happy ending for the people of God. Even though Daniel saw these various things a little horn would do, persecuting the saints, changing the law of God, he saw that this power would eventually come to its end and that God would set up his kingdom. Notice Daniel 7, verse 26. It says, The judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his, they're talking about the little horn, take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Every vision that we've seen so far, it always ends with, God setting up his kingdom. Once again, this is the same story. God pitches himself as victorious, his people as victorious, and a kingdom, an everlasting kingdom that will be set up. Where there's no police, where there's no prisons, where there's no sickness, death, poverty, or suffering. And God is inviting each one of us to be part of that kingdom tonight. In Matthew 25, verse 34, he says, Come ye blessed of my Father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Friends, Jesus Christ wants to share that kingdom with each one of us. Time is running out for planet Earth. We are going to find out in our next lectures 
that we are right in the middle of the final events of Bible prophecy. The Bible tells us that this power would receive a deadly wound, the wound will be healed, and eventually the whole world will wander and follow after this system. We are right at the doors of this taking place. And I want to encourage you tonight, friends, to take the hand of Jesus Christ. Look to Him as your Lord and Saviour. Don't look to man. Don't go and get your sins confessed by man or look to man for spiritual guidance. Look to your Bible and to the Lord Jesus Christ. He will guide and He will lead and direct you into the truth. You know, our next meeting, we're going to continue on from this point. Our next meeting is called the Seal of the Living God. God's end time seal. What is it? How do we get it? Friends, you need to be here tomorrow night as we continue on this big picture.